ça va Merci. Et toi euh, Très bien. Les micros en général, ça tape oui, un peu. Welcome. Bonjour, Roxane. Merci. Do we have a kiss too Oui, yeah, from far away then. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Um, I guess, Martha, everybody knows a lot about your background already, having launched uh, lastminute.com in 1998. Since then, you've been involved with a lot of other companies, Marks and Spencer, uh, Lucky Voice is another one. Um, but in the last couple of years, you've been kind of involved in this, I guess we can kind of look at it as a crusade. Yes. To get <laughs> no one dead yet. As many people know. as possible uh, online in the UK. But why? That's a good question. I guess uh, I always think about my life as extraordinarily lucky, despite the stick. You know, I have had two pretty profound effects of technology. Firstly, with LastMinute.com, uh, someone referred to me the other day as a dot-com dinosaur, which I don't know whether <laughs> that's a compliment or I should panic. Uh, and obviously, that changed my life. It changed my you know, horizons, my resources. And then I had a very serious car accident and it was changed very profoundly again. And technology helped me survive and helped me stay in touch and helps me be a lot better at all the things I'm involved in. So when I was asked by the previous government if I would like to, and I quote my entire job spec, help disadvantaged communities using technology, end job spec, uh, I thought that was an exciting challenge. And subsequently, I've met people who've told me that the internet has saved their lives which is quite a humbling and inspiring and surprising thing, even when you've worked in technology. And that galvanizes you and inspires you. I'm sure it does. How has it uh, saved their lives, just out of curiosity? Well, there are 8 million adults in the UK who've never been online, as well as a huge number of issues around how the charitable and the small business sector use technology. Uh, and if you look at those 8 million adults, then they are predominantly older and predominantly from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And if you look at what the web gives you, and it's obvious when you're online, but it's not clear when you're not, better access to education, more chances to get a job, less isolated feeling, saving money, and saving money even if you come from the lowest income household. So I would argue that now more than ever, it's absolutely essential that we give people the tools in order to be able to manage complex, difficult lives. And so that's why, uh, yes, I uh, wobble out of bed to try and encourage millions more people to have access to technology. Great. And I guess if we have Mike with us today as well, it's also in part thanks to the report that you wrote a couple of years ago. Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about that report, where it came from and what it led to with, uh, with Mike's yes. organization? This incredible beast porn. <laughs> um, not a very clever piece of thinking, but the heaviest users of government services are also the most offline. I made a very small link that if government just used the internet better, much better, not only would it make people's lives a lot more easy, because if you ever tried to connect, collect sorry, your benefits using the internet, you want to have a nervous breakdown. And I think it's not really acceptable as citizens that we pay for substandard government public services. And so what we wanted to do is make a much, much simpler, much, much better, very, very user-focused proposition at the core of government about how government would use technology. And I was delighted that Mike uh, was the person that took up that challenge. So obviously, as Martha is trying to get more and more people online, mm -hmm. um, you are trying to make it much more easy for people to access government services sure. um, with gov.uk, mm -hmm. launched in beta earlier this year. Do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of how you're running that operation and why it's different than essentially what other governments have done in the past? Well, it's different in a number of ways. Firstly, the culture behind it is very much consistent with probably your visitors here and the companies here in that it's uh, urgent and quick and it's full of developers and it's an engineer-led culture. We use a lot of emergent technology. We fail fast, we launch quickly, and that's very different for government because government's thought about the internet as it's thought about all technology, which is over sort of five, 10-year cycles. So we're profoundly changing how we work and how we deal with the internet inside of government. Also, the major difference is that we're not being driven by the needs of the government, which is usually the way. We're been uh, driven by user needs. So our mantras are it's faster, simpler, and cheaper. And everything we do is led by user need and user demand. We're behaving as if we are not in a monopoly because one of the problems that government has is many government agencies and departments have behaved that way for such a long time. They think, well, we have this service offline and we'll, we'll just put a form online. And that's not good enough anymore. And one of the reasons that's not good enough is we have a whole generation of people now who are simply not engaging with the state. So our challenge is actually to, to regain their trust digitally and reset the relationship between the individual and the state. 
Interesting. So if I, if I understood correctly, you're essentially running what you're doing like you would run a startup. Absolutely. Interesting. And so you say now that it's very kind of focusing on the user, on the mm -hmm. user experience, on the user needs. Can you give an example of how this is different from what currently exists? What are you implementing? Well, right now, even in the beta of uh, GovUK, which we launched in January, you'll see very simple services such as statutory maternity pay, a, a good example of a mainstream service that millions of people use. And we looked at that service and we, we worked out that the vast majority of people who use that service don't want to complete a long form and have 26 different pages that they have to navigate. They simply just want to know how much they will receive as a maternity pay. It's now you answer three questions and you hit the red button and you get the answer very simply. And of course what happens then is that the user need is met, the user is satisfied and they go on to, to have further user needs. And there's nothing pretty revolutionary about that. The technology for that sort of stuff is what web companies have been doing for the last 10, 15 years. It's just very different for government. There's something actually quite exciting happening, I think, and it's kind of ironic that we're sitting right here in the middle of Westminster because uh, when I've been lucky enough to sort of have a look around Europe and see what other countries are doing, the UK government is taking a pretty world-leading position both in its support of trying to get millions more people better access to better technology, but also in the way it's breaking the old way of doing things with mm -hmm. establishment of things like the government digital service or redoing IT procurement contracts, trying to spin it out more towards smaller companies. And I think if you look at the UK now in terms of both what's happening with the tech city and all the initiatives that were talked about this morning and alongside some of the innovation in government, we've got to keep joining it up. It's hard, it'll take a long time, but it's actually very interesting and quite world leading. So if this is so beneficial, then how come more governments aren't operating like this? Some are. Some are. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 um, I, I think that um, I can, Mike's got probably a different perspective. I think my perspective would be some are. If you go to Estonia or you go to Lithuania or you go to Latvia or some of the countries that can start from less of a legacy than perhaps the Victorian-style British government, then they've got internet access at 98 99% and people using online services from government at the same kind of levels. <laughs> I was lucky enough to meet the uh, Estonian president, he's called the Geek Prime Minister, and he said to me, it's very simple, you get millions more people online by bringing government into the 21st century and providing brilliant services. He saw it as a very, very simple circle, but he didn't have the complexity of government that perhaps some longer established governments have. So some countries are doing it very well, Canada is doing it very well, Australia is doing some interesting things, Singapore is doing some interesting things, but it's very hard, I think Mike can mm -hmm. take the the harder part of this question about how complex it is. Well, what, what is the big challenge then with operating like this? One of the big challenges, as Martha said, is that many of these countries who've got it right are small or they're federated, so they do it at federal level. And we're not unique, but we're in a bunch of countries who do a vast, bewildering number of public services, but also with huge complexity. And actually, that's the real challenge, is to make it fair for everyone and so that everyone can use this stuff. The biggest single challenge, actually, and the one I hope to talk to people here today about, is to get companies such as the ones represented here into the supply chain, because we need that innovative spark. And one of the big problems we've had in the UK until recently, in January, a parliamentary report labeled our supply chain an oligopoly because so much of our techni technology infrastructure was held with a very small number of large contracts with large companies. And the big challenge is to get these companies in. And we're doing that right now. The spur to doing it, and you asked me at the start of this question, why other countries are not doing it, I think they're, they're all going to start because we haven't got the money to play the game that we used to play anymore. This stuff is much more expensive. Now, we're all about user need, but even if we put that to one side, Governments must look at this model and see that it's, it, it's massively um, more efficient in terms of delivery of service, and especially when you have services which are so good that means people don't use any other channel to engage with the state. Because the Treasury alone in this country estimates that just the administrative cost of services is £3.8 billion a year in terms of savings. So if we can start to make some of these services more attractive to users, there's vast savings for governments, and we think that most governments will go down this path sooner or later. So you're telling me that it's incredibly cost-effective what you're doing? Hugely, but we're, we're not there yet. Can you break it down a little bit, uh, maybe some of the details of what you've been able to save? 
Well, so far we've taken many of our, our contracts and we've just simply not renewed those. So along with ICT colleagues, we've saved um, over half a billion pounds already, but that's as a byproduct of doing what we're doing. That's not, we didn't go out with the express interest to save a certain amount of money. That's just, that's just what we've saved as a result of making some better user services. We're not, at the moment, we're working out what the real potential value is, but we, we understand it's billions. We just don't know how, how, how much yet. And um, we'll get to that later in the year, but it's crucial that we're not driven by a number. It's crucial that we are driven by user need and user demand because the savings will follow. Most transaction costs are around 12 pounds with government on a face-to-face -face channel or via post, and they, they, they fall to somewhere between 15, 30, 35 pence when we do them digitally, and that's a, that's a, a colossal saving. It's true also, and we've been looking a lot at the charitable sector and the small and medium business sector, and uh, launched an organization called Go On UK, supported by some big corporates to help address digital capability, and what's really struck us is not only government taking a lead in service redesign using technology, but the potential in the charitable sector that really has only begun to be tapped into. So, for example, we got 17 homeless charities together, and you might think, well, homeless people, what the hell, you know, the internet, that's, that's not going to be very helpful. But actually, 50% of homeless people have a mobile phone, and yet not very many homeless charities have the capability or the experience to be able to say, well, how can we redesign our service so that we can help those people using mobile, using smartphones in the future, using text, whatever the thing may be. So government is one piece of the puzzle that's extremely exciting. There's then you've got the charitable sector and you've got the commercial sector to really try and build this whole piece together. So, so you mentioned Go On UK, which is the name of the campaign or uh, the program that you're currently running. And, and this came from Race Online. That's right. No, we had, uh, you know, obviously I wasn't given any money to do this crazy uh, job of helping people using technology. So I raised a challenge to the country, Race Online 2012. I said, let's get the commercial sector and the charitable sector behind trying to get as many people online as possible by 2012. We did okay, but not well enough. So we established Go On UK outside government. We've got uh, the BBC, Lloyds Bank, Eon Energy, Everything Everywhere, the Post Office, Talk Talk, and the Big Lottery Fund, and Age UK, who've come together. They've all put resources in to create a charity that's independent and will continue to fight the case as, why, as to why we as the UK have done pretty well, but we need to go even further to build digital skills. So you say it was somewhat successful, but not that successful. How, what are the numbers? What are we actually well, talking I, about? It, when I started uh, my role, 10.5 million people had never been online, and now it's around eight, um, which is you know, an improvement, but certainly extraneous factors, not just our campaign has to do with that as well. But the numbers are tricky. You know, we also know that there are a million new people online through something called the UK Online Centre Network, and the libraries claim another 2.5 million people are online. So it depends which sample size, and we need to get a better basket of measures, but there's still a way to go. And to get this remaining 8 million people online, what is the big barrier? That, is it cost barrier? Is it, um, is it just not a, a lack of interest that it's, they have? It's benefits, you're right. <laughs> and it's true for an individual as much as for an organization. And you know, Go On UK has a dual mission. You know, Lloyds Bank, Eon Energy, why have they put quite considerable resources into this charity? Because they want to engage with their consumers and their customers who are both business and individuals. So there, we're going to really try and help build uh, skills beyond just individuals, but also how you would use it in your charity or business. And I think that the um, really important uh, defining thing about the organization will be that we are trying to galvanize activity across a huge different variety of partners and try and stop this sort of sporadic, uh, some people doing something about price over here, some people doing something about benefits over there, and really focus on the barriers and really try and address them. So what, what have you actually been able to propose so far? Uh, well, the, the charity is six weeks old, <laughs> so we're still formulating our plan, but we know that benefits not understanding the benefits is the biggest reason why people don't use the internet. So we're going to build huge campaigns around national awareness of the benefits. The BBC have also worked with us on quite a lot of this already. We've also been doing some product-related stuff. So we've created a much cheaper PC, very cheap PC for people on benefits. How so cheap? £95 if you're on benefits. Um, a recycled PC, it's fine. It does the job well. And then we'll also be addressing the final barrier, which is the access point and the infrastructure point. So those are the three big things, benefits, cost, and access. So the number that I've actually seen getting thrown around is 159 pounds for yeah, that was PC a PC with a broadband connection. That's a product that came out a couple of weeks ago through one of our partners, Talk Talk and Microsoft. And yes, it's you know that's the beginning. It's very new. It's a couple of weeks old, but it's that kind of product. We want to keep pushing the pressure on the price. And the price is only one element. What's been the uptake and the reaction to it so it's far? It's a tiny pilot, so they're still small numbers. And as I say. 
uh, what we hope with Going UK is being able to push out products through that combined network of partners, which is pretty formidable, but we haven't attempted to start that yet. That's to come in the next few years. Okay. Great. And Mike, I know that you mentioned earlier that you guys are using new technologies, trying to leverage sure. uh, as much as you can. Can mm -hmm. you be more specific? I know you guys have uh, open source, source code. You're yeah. using HTML5, mobile applications. Can you maybe develop a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, we, we look, we're, we're doing it quickly. So we, we look at bootstrapping the technology we need. It's predominantly open source on our platform. In fact, I think it's now all, all open source. We use things like Sola for search. Um, because actually, we left it to the engineers and the developers to select the technologies that they felt was better for the job. And that, that's what selected our, our, we publish our architecture. It's very open. Everything we do is on GitHub, or not quite everything, but what's on GitHub because it's going to be shared. And actually, we now have a community of developers who are changing our code and improving our code for us. So the whole platform is open source. And in doing so, we're not just welcoming people to be on our platform over time, but we're welcoming a community of developers to suggest better uses of technology. So it's change this model where government selects and locks in a technology which keeps people out and we're actually saying look we're pretty open about our technology choices and the moment that something comes along that's better we'll choose that. Oh, that's terrific. Well Martha I have to ask you one last question because uh, now that we know that you're still involved not just with the public sector but also with a number of different companies uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the startups that you're currently working with? That's a good question I think that's the single question I'm asked the most, particularly by CEOs who want a kind of quick download of all the things they can say to be sound really cool when they're at board meetings and conferences. Um, one of the companies that I am uh, getting close to at the moment started by Alice Taylor. I'm sure many people in the room know her. She's a games expert, used to work at Channel 4. That was where we met. She started a really smart little company that does 3D printing toys, and they want to be the next Lego. And uh, there's three women running that company. And frankly, I think that they might well have a good shot at becoming the next Lego. So I really like the whole 3D printing phenomena. Um, I'm also uh, very interested, obviously, in the kind of cross-sector of charitable and um, philanthropic and technology things that are happening. And there's a number of different organizations that are trying to put technology at the heart of kind of social causes, you know, whether that's Avaz from a campaigning point of view, Ushahidi trying to do development of crisis uh, solutions very quickly through crowdsourcing, or whether it's something a bit more localized. And we've got lots of interesting small examples like FreeCycle here who are doing uh, your ability to recycle locally. So that kind of nexus of the charitable and the commercial is also, I think. And should we expect to see you launching a company again anytime soon? I don't think I'll launch anymore. I'm lucky <laughs> voice. My crazy karaoke <laughs> business is doing some stuff interestingly online. But uh, I would be very sad if I wasn't lucky enough to be able to talk to a lot of them and meet them and have some fun with them. Great. Well, thank you both very much. Um, I guess we can take a question. If there's time for questions. No. Nope. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.